are in Philippians chapter 2 tonight. I've been teaching through Philippians as I cover for Steve. We got to Philippians 2, 12 is where we ended up uh, about a week ago, I guess now, on a Sunday night. So if you want to hear all of Philippians, you have to go back and get all the studies. I'll either do it on a Sunday morning, a Wednesday night, or a Sunday night, and I'm working through the book of Philippians. So the verse in chapter 12, I mean verse 12, starts with... uh, Verse, chapter 2, verse 12, it starts with therefore. And if a verse starts with therefore, you kind of need to know what it's there for. Thank you. And what it's there for is um, Paul is just encouraging this church at uh, Philippi. And he's just really done an awesome job through the first uh, chapter and a half of just reminding them that... The Lord just loves them and there's nothing that he wouldn't do for them and that he is going to um, pour out his life. And that's just a great reminder for us. And the rest of what Paul's doing with this church is just encouraging them to continue in that that, um, grace and that spirit that God's poured out into their lives and not get their eyes on anything else. And so he says, I'll read it and you can follow along, verse 12 of chapter 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing. I hate that verse. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. Wow. That sounds like today. Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on uh, on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But as you know, his proven character that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him, to, send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, just for your willingness to continue that work. God, um, you said that we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And Lord, we just want to um, be men and women here tonight that just look to you, that are resting in you, that have no other hope than in you. And God, we want to see your miracles done in, in our world. We want to be that light that truly is your love and your mercy reflected through our lives because you've poured so much into us. And God, we ask that we would live for you um, brightly. Lord, um, one of the things you told the church, uh, uh, the churches in Revelation, one of the churches, uh, is that they were to return to their first love. And that's you. And God, we just, we just want to return here tonight to you. And, and uh, Lord, we want to surrender everything, uh, uh, all the stuff that you talked to us about tonight, God. We want to give it to you, and we want to follow you, and we want to get our eyes on you. And Lord, not on our sin, not on the world, but on you. And God, that you would give us hope, and you'd begin to um, just, you, you said that there, there's hope of coming good in this life. And God, we want that for um, our families and for our fellowship, and for our city, and for our nation, God, uh, even for our world. We ask that you do a mighty um, revival, Lord, and start with us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's interesting that uh, really what Paul wants to do with this church is talk to them about their salvation, right? Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And Paul goes, you know, Paul is there. You guys got it, man. You you have to run after Jesus. You have to understand that there's a work to be done. Now, there is a work that needs to be done on a daily basis in our lives. 
There's a work that the Lord wants to do for each and every one of us, but it's not work. So there is a work that needs to be done, and I'll, but I'm first going to tell you what it isn't. Ephesians 2.8 says this, By grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And Romans 9.31 kind of gives a, uh, another flavor to what that work is all about that we're not uh, be partaking in. It says, But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. And in Galatians 2.16, Paul writes, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we, have be- even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, for by works of the law no flesh shall be justified. And so when you begin to rec- recognize that God goes, hey man, I want you to take your salvation seriously. I want you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Is he talking about keeping all the rules? That's just the opposite of what he's talking about. We have two rules as Christians. You know what they are? Love God. Love others. So if you do those, you got it all covered. But that's really that work that God wants us to be headed toward. And, and there's a way to recognize whether you're involved in that work that God has for you. Ephesians 2.10 goes on to say that you're his workmanship... Created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. God has a plan for each and every one of us. He has a work designed for you. And, it's, and, and honestly, do you know what it is? And if you don't, it's because you're not looking around. Are you married? How many of you are married? Okay. All you that are married... All you have to do is look for your husband or wife and go, there's my work. That's my ministry. That's my first ministry. I wish my wife was here. I need to send her this message. <laughs> oh, no, I'm supposed to supply that, right? Uh, and actually, you can pray for her. She's sick. She's got the flu. It's bad. I slept in the other room. <laughs> in love, though. Um. When you look at what God has for you, it's here today. If you're not married, how many of you are not married? Raise your hand. Do you have kids? Of you that aren't married, do you, how many of you have kids? There's a ministry, right? That's a ministry that God's given you. I work. There's things to be done. As much as they'll let you, at least. But there's a way to be a witness into their lives. And if you didn't get any of those how many of you have a job that didn't fill those two anybody left that just didn't isn't married and doesn't have any kids okay there you go you have and if you have a job or if you have a friend or if you have a church you have a ministry figure out what it is you have one today and the ministry God wants you about is doing the work that he designed for you. That's part of your salvation. Here's, here's why it's part of your salvation. What did Jesus say to his disciples about who's going to be the greatest in God's kingdom? Remember what they were doing? The, the disciples are awesome. I just love them because they give me hope for me. They're walking, Jesus is in front of them. They're walking behind him arguing about, I'm going to be a bit greater in God's kingdom than you are. No, I, no, you know what? Jesus loves me more. I can see me and Steve do this. When we were first Christians, I'm sure we did it in some ways. And Jesus stops them and goes, hey, guys, what are you talking about? And, uh, you know, they're like, um, uh, 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 what, you're uh, uh, the Broncos? <laughs> Maybe they didn't say the Broncos. He goes, yeah, we're talking about who's going to be the greatest. And he goes, whoever's the greatest is, it's going to be the servant. The servant's going to be the greatest because I'm the greatest servant. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And so when I look at my relationship with the Lord, and what Paul's doing with this church is going, 
when you look at your relationship with the Lord, there's a whole priority that's supposed to be in place in your life. The world is constantly telling you that you are the center of the universe. That you're the most important thing on the face of the planet. And Jesus is saying, I am. I'm it. Before Jesus came, all of creation looked forward to him coming. And after he left, all we do is look back to that moment that Jesus hung on a cross to pay for our sin. How many of you have never sinned? Come on, there has to be... Yeah, there's no, nobody, right? And if, if you're new tonight, understand that if you've sinned, you're probably the smallest sinner in this whole group. Because we're here because we desperately need to be forgiven. We've been selfish and self-centered, and we need a Lord that will come in and serve us in the manner of being the payment for our sin. You know, Mike's talking about um, the fact that our nation, excuse me for a second, is guilty of killing little babies. And that deserves judgment for sure. Absolutely deserves judgment. God's angry at it every day. And yet, God hanging on a cross 2,000 years ago paid for every sin that was ever committed. Every politician that agreed with that, every, every you know, uh, and my wife will tell you her story. She, my wife had an abortion. And when she got saved, she all of a sudden realized, you know, I had an abortion and now I understand what God thought of that. And she had to come to him and just go, Lord, I'm so sorry. And it was a real struggle for her to be able to go, you know, that's, I, I took a life. How can you forgive me? My own child. What I love is that's such a great picture of who Jesus is. Because he forgives that. Because he understands that life is, um, in, in our world, in this life, we're all bent towards selfishness. That's why he came. That's what being a servant is. And, and now as we, as Christians, who have experienced this incredible forgiveness. So for my wife, you know, I, she got saved and I got saved a little bit later. And then um, we're talking about a year after that. And, and she's just really going back through and recognizing, oh, my gosh, this it was really bad. And we're sitting there, and I, I remember it so clearly, just her, her getting to the place where she truly accepted the forgiveness of Jesus in that. And she was set free. Jesus said I, he came to set us free that we would be free indeed, right? And, and free from what? Ourselves, our sin, all those things. And so when you're working out your salvation with fear and trembling, it's getting into agreement with the Lord. It's allowing God to be the one that directs your life. You no longer get to direct your life. You know, we're talking about our times, and you, you look at what's going on. And, and I, I honestly do. I get real excited about what's going on. Because it's so dark out there, I don't have to do much to be a light. It's just awesome. You can be a light because the world doesn't know what to do with you when you go. And I do counseling all the time, and I'll be talking to people, and they're really struggling. And this is one of the questions I ask them. This is something that you want to really help people with. Because Christians struggle with this, too. I'll ask them, are you a good person? Now, know this, that's a trick question. So if in your head you went, oh, yeah, I'm a good person, do this. <laughs> Jesus didn't die for good people. He wouldn't need to. He died for sinners, right? That's who he died for. 
And so when I'm talking to people, I go, are, are you a good person? They go, yeah, I'm a good person. I go, that's the problem. That's why you're so miserable. You're trying to be good. You're not working out your salvation with fear and trembling. You're trying to do works. You're trying to do something that the Lord never called you to do. That's not what he wants in your life at all. He wants to be the one that's guiding and directing and giving you that heart that he has. Watch what he does with this. So he says, work out your own salvation. And, and obviously Paul says, whether when I was there or after I've left, I want you to be the same way. It doesn't matter who's around. You need to be the same way with, with whatever set of friends, whether you're at work, you're at church. You need to be the same exact way. I have the standard. The standard is this. This is the truth. And I don't change my opinion for anybody. There's, uh, gosh, who said that? It's in my notes someplace. Oh, John Wesley said this. I'm sick and I am sick of opinions. Give me a humble, gentle lover of God and, uh, and a man uh, a man full of mercy and good fruits without partiality or hypocrisy. Opinions are like armpits. Everybody has them. They all stink. I, I don't want to be someone that's having their own opinion. I want to be someone that's resting in the truth and allowing God to direct every step. Again, my righteousness is in that Jesus paid for me. And now I'm his... I'm his what? Bond servant. I'm a guy that said, I'll be, I'll just do whatever you want. You know, I, I notice people really struggle, and, and I just want to encourage you. I don't know where everybody's at here tonight, but if you've never got to that point where you're you're dealing with the Lord and you sit there and you go, and for me that happened when I was 28, 1984, about September. And, and I'd heard the gospel. I had recognized there was a God and the Bible was trustworthy and the Bible says that I was desperately in trouble. I was headed for hell. And when I heard that and really got that, I, I left the guy that had just basically kindly said, um, you're headed for hell. Good luck with that. And, he, and really, he was just, he, was, he wasn't being sarcastic. He was being sarcastic because that's what I needed. But he left me with, that's what you have. Do you want to keep it? So I'm driving along, and I want forgiveness. I just want it. And I know there's a cost to it. And the cost is, he gets to run my life. If I'm going to accept his gift of forgiveness then I have to give him my life that's the deal he doesn't accept it any other way he now gets to be in charge of my life work out your salvation with fear and trembling I am now his bond servant what does he want me to be doing for me it's so clear that moment is so so indelibly etched in my brain one minute I'm doing things on my own the next, I've said, if you'll forgive me, I'll, I'll do whatever you ask. And, and at that moment, for me, there was this amazing awareness of forgiveness and being clean. And I, was, I, I went, something happened here. I don't know what it is, but I really like this. This is awesome. And then I began to go, okay, what would God have me do? Because I'd given him my life. First thing I did, went and told, told my brother, and my brother was a, a guy that claimed to be an atheist. So how did that go? Oh, yeah, he mocked me. So I'm like, okay, I'm not telling anybody else again for a while. But I went, and I began to just get rid of, and really the Spirit of God began to work in my life, and stuff began to change. And all of a sudden I went to church. And things were beginning to change radically in my life. People began to notice that I was nicer and kinder. Why? Because it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. 
God's got a work for you, and it's, it's his good pleasure. And he's got people around for you to pour out your life into. He's got a job for you. Remember Ephesians 2.10? You're his workmanship and created in Christ Jesus for good works. And you need to be about that work. And how you can tell you have the right attitude about that, right? Because that's what we want to do. Anybody not want to do the will of God? Raise your hand. Well, if somebody raises their hand, step back from them. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, we all do. We struggle with it and what it is and all that certainly is a struggle. But I, would, I want to be on the side of the guy that loves me and loves the world and has truth and mercy and kindness because I know what Satan has. I lived with him for 28 years. And he brought horror into my life. And who I was was not somebody that brought, that brought light or goodness or kindness. That change that God expects in our life is be about his business of reaching into messy people's lives. Hear what I just said. Whether it's your husband or your kids or your friend or church people that bug the snot out of you. There's only two of them, but we know who you are. I'm kidding. That's me, probably. It's certainly a work that God wants to do in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, right? But that work has to be done uniquely different and it, it's done in verse 14 do all things without complaining and disputing that's a lousy verse right exodus seventeen twelve is a picture of the children of israel in the desert headed for the promised land and they're going through some testing and some trials and they're to be following the Lord and things aren't going exactly the, the, the way that they want the food's not the way they want the water's not the way they want and they do some interesting things they say give us water that we may drink so Moses said to them why do you contend with me why do you tempt the Lord and the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst. It's not the people around us. God's allowing stuff into your life. Can anything come into your life without God allowing it? If you're a Christian, the answer is absolutely not. Now, just don't change your name to Job. But honestly, God, your name is Job. God's going to allow some stuff to come into your life. Jesus promised, in this life you will have tribulation. Just as the world hated you, uh, hated me, they will hate you. Why? Why? Can't can we just all get along? <laughs> no, because Satan is looking to destroy lives. You're supposed to be about the, this work that the Lord has. There's a guy named... Um, Oh, what was his name? Charlie Peace. He was a convicted murderer over in England. This is back in the um, early 1900s. Uh, they were having a revival in England at that period of time. And God is just doing this awesome movement. People were getting saved. Lives were being changed. You know, one of the pastors came, had heard about the guy. And so he came and he's waiting to actually, um, he had the uh, death sentence. And they were going to... Um, I don't know if they, I think they hung him, I don't remember. But he was waiting for the death sentence. And so this pastor comes and he shares the gospel with him. And just tells him the gospel. And this is what Charlie Peace's response was uh, to the gospel. If what you said, you've told me uh, about hell was true, um, I would crawl across England on my hands and knees through broken glass to save one person from hell. 
And part of what we forget and part of working out our salvation with fear and trembling is we're, we're literally um, just waiting for God to come and snatch us up and this corrupted body is going to put on incorruption and we're going to go into, the pre in, into his presence where there's fullness of joy, joy forevermore. It takes all of eternity for God to show us how much he loves us. What is that? I don't know. I cannot wait to find out. But for those that don't accept him, there's an, an eternity of um, the Bible de describes it as the worst place you could ever imagine. Burning, wailing, gnashing of teeth, outer darkness, loneliness. It's literally the absence of everything good. It's pain and sorrow and self-centeredness that is soul-crushing forever. It, it's, it's described as everlasting burning. And then we as Christians get to look around us and think, who do we really want to go to hell? There's not anybody I want to go to hell. I want some people to get saved and then go right to Jesus. <laughs> there, there is. There's some people that I want to get saved and go right to Jesus. Certain people that, that ought to happen. Just so that they, they can't struggle anymore with certain issues. And honestly, I think about it. If I would have got saved and went right to Jesus, I'm all good with that. Right? There's not much better than going and being with Jesus. There's nothing better than that. And yet, the Lord is just, and there's some things that need to happen, and, and um, an understanding of how much he loves us and forgiveness, forgives us, and his willingness to do that is mind-boggling. Oh, I got time. Scared myself. I thought I was supposed to be done at 8, but I have 20 minutes. I will get through this. This is good stuff. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may be blameless and harmless children. God has this plan for me, and I just need to have a good attitude about it. You're going to get bad people in your life. You're going to get messy people in your life. You're going to have a husband or a wife or children that are messy and they make your life hard, and they don't appreciate you, and there's all this stuff going on, and that's your ministry. And he's given you the ministry of reconciliation. And you're, not, you're only here for a time. This is not your home. Quit acting like it's your home. You're about to go home. And in the meantime, you can be a light and a servant. Right. What, is, what, is, what do servants do? They work. They're the last, uh, me and Matt were talking about this, and, you know, I, uh, there's just a, a constant need for me to be reminded of, I'm just here to work, and I don't need anything else. It's a privilege to do anything for Jesus. You know, you know I'm, um, obviously, I'm on staff, and sometimes that bums me out because I get paid to do church, and... Um, Sometimes it becomes a job. And I, I just have to battle and go, you know what? I, I, uh, actually, I do a, a men's study on um, Tuesday mornings. And I buy um, some, uh, what are they called, muffins for, for the guys in the morning. And one of the guys came up and goes, hey, can I get, bring stuff in the morning? And I go, no. <laughs> He's like freaked out. What? I don't hardly get to do anything for Jesus. Leave me alone. I want to bring muffins, okay? I'm looking for one stinking reward in heaven. Leave my muffins alone. And that, Really, because I, I want to be about his business. I don't want to be doing work that is obligation. It's a privilege to serve Jesus. That's what I get to do. That's what's supposed to happen, and not, there shouldn't be complaining and disputing. There should, I just get to do stuff for Jesus. Servants don't complain because they work for someone. And I work for the best guy on the, 
that there's ever been, seriously. And I'm not talking about Steve. He's okay. <laughs> but he's not like Jesus. And it's just a privilege to get to do that. And I don't need to complain about stuff. And, and, and people don't always treat me fairly. Oh, no. You know, isn't that the moment I get to be like Jesus? When someone treats me unfairly and I do good for them? When they curse me, I bless them? Oh, I, I believe there's a verse about that. And that's what this is talking about. We need to be out there and doing what God's called us to, these servants, that we don't complain and we're not disputing. And that, and in the midst of that, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God. When someone just loves the Lord and they just go through life just serving him, and you just, um, there's this lady. Um, she's, she's been gone for a long time. And I watched her life when I, and we actually moved up here in 1990, and um, her and her husband were some of the first people that came to the church, and they, they did Young Life. Uh, and um, she, she was born a Christian, <laughs> grew up with a, a dad that was a pastor, and her husband was a pastor, and she lived her whole life as being a Christian. And, 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 and um, you know, in the process of me getting to know her, I was just like, I want to be like Judy Hopkins. And I don't know if any of you know the Hopkins, but Judy Hopkins was like the best example of how to be a servant of anybody I knew. Judy Hopkins, I barely knew her. She was this tall. She had three kids. She's driving down the road, and a guy is broken down on the side of the road with a tire. Appointment by God, and she pulls over with her three kids, and this guy just had gotten out of prison. For bank robbery. And she's busy headed for some place. And she goes in and she helps him and puts him in the van with her. Takes him down to a tire store. Brings him back. And we're like, Judy, you're not real smart. But you sure are nice. And, oh, by the way, his wife was just happened to be coming to our church. We found out later. And he got saved later. And... And that, she just had an attitude of, I, I want to serve and love my Lord. Uh, some girls from our fellowship, uh, there was five or six of them that um, just had, had gone out and they'd seen this thing. And they'd come back and they, they were just kind of, um, how do I put this? They were just aware that this other person didn't have it all together. And, and so they were kind of talking about it, and then they asked Judy, and I just happened to be there. And Judy's comment was, well, I think the stuff was just interesting. And she wouldn't say a bad word. And I went, I want to be like Judy Hopkins all my life. And I, and I would love to, to say that I've got that down, but I'm still working on it. And, I, and it's this awesome thing of, I don't need to complain or I don't need to say a bad word about people. I don't need to argue. I need to be blameless. And Judy Hopkins was blameless. I mean, it was just awesome. And when you're, when you're not complaining, you're not arguing, guess what you end up being? Blameless. And people wonder, why are you like you are? When I got saved, I was uh, um, in charge of an engine and fire engine. And I... Up to that point, uh, every person I ever hired, I just um, took out and I ran them until they puked. And if they keep running until they puked, then they were a good one. And, and if they didn't, then I got rid of them. And, and my whole goal in life at that point was to get rid of all the weak ones and get the best strong ones that would make me look good. And then I became a Christian, and God goes, your job is to take care of people, so you take whoever I give you, and you pour into their lives. Well, that was a novel concept, right? It's different than my previous standard. So I began to just go, okay, I'm just going to pour into their lives, but they're weak and slow. And they were. And, and that year, my engine 
was the highest rated engine on the force. They, they test you on, on your ability to do certain tasks. And so they go around the whole force and they test you. And, th and that engine was the highest ranked engine because those guys would do anything for me because I had become blameless. I, I'd put God first and I, I was pouring into his lives. And this is what I'm saying. We all have that opportunity and we need a changed world, right? That's what we're looking for. We're, we want people coming to know Jesus and they only do that when they see us being like him. That's the best thing ever that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We got that one down. That's, that is a, an absolute perfect um, picture of our world. And you can be a shining light in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain, Yes, and I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. And what Paul's saying is, I get the privilege of pouring out my life and serving you guys and seeing what you guys are doing and, and your service. They had sent a guy to help him, and we'll see that later on in this chapter. And they just had an uh, absolute joy of being like-minded in, in one accord and willing to just put the things of God first. So as we were doing that, that uh, mid-glow, you know, what we're sitting there doing is going, Lord, I just want to worship you, and I want to let you into my life, and I want to hear from you. And he begins to pour into our lives, and then he begins to talk to us, and he begins to encourage us. And that, that's the whole process there of allowing uh, God to use us in people's lives. And, and tonight, there was a great example of this very principle that you became a drink offering as you shared what God had shown you. And you became an encouragement and you became a light. And, uh, and Christians are supposed to be known for their love for one another. Certainly for their love for the Lord, more importantly, but there's supposed to be this incredible change in our lives. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me, Paul says to them. Because they, they had been at this incredibly effective church. And then Paul says this in verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. That I may be encouraged when I know your state. And so Paul goes, man, you guys are people that are just so precious. I'm going to send Timothy. And Timothy is the one guy, he says in verse 20, for I have no one like-minded who can sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, but not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. And Timothy is a guy that you can trust. Uh, Tim Timothy is a guy that's got this awesome reputation, that he's like-minded, he's headed the same direction. And really what's supposed to happen for us as Christians is as we start on different sides of um, life, honestly, of issues, we're trying to become like-minded with Jesus. And I start over here, and you may start over here, but ultimately we end up being like-minded in one accord, in agreement, because the Bible teaches us how to get in agreement, because we're, we're getting rid of our opinions, and we're going with what the Lord has to say. That's what we're here for. It's uniquely different. The world doesn't get it, and it, it's certainly what we're supposed to be known for. Um, we did a marriage conference a couple weeks ago, and the guy that did it, how many of you went to that? Two of you. Okay, the rest of you missed an awesome, <laughs> just an awesome retreat. But the guy that did it, uh, his name is Dave uh, Zamorano, and uh, he comes from um, a fire background. He was a fireman for 20-plus years almost 30, and the one, of, one of the things that he talked about is just the uniqueness of the bond in the fire service, that, that they really were his brothers. And what I, I will tell you for sure, what's supposed to happen for us as Christians is we're supposed to have a better bond than any fireman ever had. 
than any soldier ever had because you are supposed to be about his business, servants and soldiers headed the direction that Jesus wants you to go. You have a mission, and it, it is supposed to cause us to be like-minded in one accord. And then we're supposed to be people that are trustworthy. And how do you become that trustworthy person that Timothy was? This. Right here. You know, um, as I deal with marriage issues, my, the only thing I really have to do is get the husband and wife to agree that this is going to be the standard that they go by. As soon as I get them to agree that, they hardly need to talk to me anymore. They, they'll ask, where is that verse? Uh, okay, go find it yourself because I want them to work. But and I'll tell them. But when I can get a husband and a wife to agree, I'm not going with my opinion anymore. I'm going with what the word has to say. They become um, incredibly different. Their lives become different. They, they have an agreement to how they're, uh, they're doing finances and how they're raising their children and how they're just prioritizing life because they go to the word and they get it figured out. If you're struggling in your marriage, man, that's what you do. You start and you go, I'm going by the word. You know, what I wanted to do is tell my wife, you need to start, you go by the word. And if you do that, well, I might join in. And actually, I tried that for a couple of years as a Christian. And, and then I, was, I realized my marriage was getting worse. And I spent enough time to go, Lord, I need to figure out how to be the husband that you've called me to be. And quit worrying about having the wife that I'm supposed to have. And, and that's the process that we're doing when we become this person like Timothy that is trustworthy. That can be sent to really go out and be about the business. And, and so Paul says, I'm going to send you Timothy. This guy is a proven character. He's a guy that loves the word, that stands on it, and doesn't change. That's incredibly valuable. Romans 12, 16 says this, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. The only way I speak the same thing as somebody else is if I've been studying the word and allowing God to show me how, where to stand and how to live my life. So I, I moved up in 90 and helped Steve start the fellowship, and then I moved away in 96, I believe it was, and I was gone for nine years. And I'm, I'm in Colorado, and I'm, uh, I'm teaching Bible studies, and I end up being a pastor, and I end up moving back here in 2005. And, and, and me and Steve are typical guys. We talked once a year whether we needed to or not. And, and so we're going to have this great in-depth conversation that, you know, there, he's not telling me we're not spending. We're, it just doesn't happen. We're guys. We don't need to do that. If me and Steve go to Spokane, there's about 30 words that need to be spoken. And then we get out and we're like, oh, that was a great trip. Yes, good trip. I mean, really, that's the way it goes for us. And, and I can tell you, he's one of my best friends. No question about it. All that, though, to say when I got back, after being apart for nine years, we were more like-minded than ever. Because I'd spent years in the Word, and he'd spent years in the Word. That's what it does. Um, you know, the only way churches get off and split and they have all these issues is they're just not being faithful to be real solid in the Word. I, I, I love this fellowship specifically because Steve teaches through the Word so faithfully and you get the whole counsel of God and it, it's something that, that you're left with no options if you're going to sit here other than to go oh yeah I kind of have to apply this stuff and, and you you figure out where to stand on certain issues so that we can be effective as a body and that's that's certainly what Timothy was he was this awesome guy that stood in the right places that had become like-minded
Later on in Philippians 3.16, Paul says, Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. And, and again, in Philippians 4.2, he talks about a couple of people, and he says um, to them, because there's some issues in the church, to be of the same mind in the Lord. And, and there's, there's no options for us as Christians. You get it figured out. If you're in disagreement with somebody, get it figured out. Get like-minded. Don't, you don't get to sit and be angry with people. You get it figured out. You go to the Word. You do Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is just, if you have a problem with somebody, you go to them alone. And if they don't hear you, you take two or three. And then if that doesn't work out, then you tell it to the church. And, and there's a process to that whole thing. I don't, if, if my wife doesn't um, get into agreement with me after I take her to Steve... <laughs> Then I go tell everybody I know. No, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> Basically, if, if someone's really hard, and um, I, this has only happened a few times for me, that, that I can take people to the word, and I go, this is the way it goes, and they go, I don't care, I'm just going to do it. Then, then basically I'm not hiding their sin as much as I used to. Love covers a multitude of sin. That's what's supposed to go on. But at some point, I, I'm willing to go, listen, that's not what's happening. This person has some other issues going on. That's a process in Matthew 18. But that's what helps us be like-minded in one accord and be this person that's trustworthy. You want to be someone that's trustworthy. That, that um, honestly, Paul could send. You know, later on, and it's unfortunate, and it's kind of the way it goes, Paul just talks about um, the fact that there's no one that's still with him. Everyone had departed from him. And, and, you know, obviously that happened to Jesus too. And sometimes that happens with us. But what I know is God always uses any of those moments to take us to, I'm just standing with Jesus. I don't care about anything else. And that's a great place. It's me and Jesus first. And it's not about others. But beyond that, then what I understand is if I'm just standing with the Lord, God's always going to pour in and he's going to use people and, and we're a body. And, you know, we started tonight by um, allowing God to use us individually to encourage each other. That's how the body works. To help us get like-minded in one accord. To be trustworthy people that stand on the word and that really are working out our salvation that just recognize, man, I got I have a work today. So as I was talking about that, and I was asking, you know, look, who's who's your work? And there's there's a few things, and usually work is not all that pleasant. You ever notice that? I mean, I like to work, but I I am glad when it's over and I don't have to sweat anymore, and and it, and I can rest. But nevertheless, work's the best thing that I can be doing. I'm a servant of the living Lord, and I need to be about the business that he created me for. And that's certainly for every single one of us. And you just have to find that work today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for tonight. God, thank you that um, it's never about us. It's always about you. God, I just ask that you'd pour into each of our hearts, that you would um, just... Give us an abundant measure of your spirit, Lord, that um, rivers of living water would pour out of us, and it would just be you. And it's because we know how much you love us, and that you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us, and Lord, that you're going to complete the good work you start in us. Lord, we have everything that we need other than just to be about your business, and so Lord, help us just get our eyes on you. Be faithful men and women to love you and be a light to a lost world. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.